Pleasant good evening to everyone. Let me take this time to welcome all to this third part of our webinar series, our five part webinar series. We thank all participants for taking the time to join with us as we discuss sport and its importance to Trinidad and Tobago. This evening's topic will be university sport and its importance. But before we go there, I want to take this opportunity to thank our president of the International University Sport Federation, President Oleg Martinson, who is also the Russian Minister of Sport. He couldn't be here with us this evening in person on our panel discussions, but he has sent his greetings. And at this time, allow me to play greetings and to bring greetings from the president of the International University Sport Federation, who ensured that he gave his blessings to this webinar on university sports and its importance. Dear friends, Thank you for inviting me to join today. I'm sorry, I'm not able to join you for the full panel discussion. My congratulations to Ayan and his team for organizing this event. Clearly, we are facing a difficult time for universities. I know there are many questions over the coming academic year in America. In the face of these difficulties, it is especially impressive to see the way you are reaching out to each other. This way you can make sure that we don't just return to normal after the pandemic. You can help make sure we are in a better place in terms of university sport, elite sport and community sport. We have all worked hard to help people to stay active throughout the lockdowns caused by coronavirus. But the reality is that for many people, the time at home was not filled with sport. This issue of activity levels across our societies is one of the reasons why university sport is so important. For both mental and physical health, the regular practice of physical activity and sport is clearly vital. At FISU, we are working hard to ensure wider participation. The Healthy Campus program has now been made available to interested universities around the world. The International Day of University Sport provides a singular focus every year. But we must also see university sport as part of a wider ecosystem where universities can play a special role. After all, it is at university that a young person can develop habits for a lifetime. 
but it is clearly helpful if students arrive at universities with understanding of sport and regular practices. And it is clear, helpful if the university can assure students where in the community they can continue to enjoy sport after they graduate. For this reason, I have been very happy to see that your seminars have been bringing together all of the actors involved in sport at different levels. I have no doubt that will be a success. Please accept my best wishes for your work. And before I leave, please allow me to say big up to our FISU student ambassador, Timothy Terry. Thank you very much. And we want to thank the president again of the International University Sport Federation for his greetings to our webinar this evening. I am excited about the discussions today. I know that you are. We have a host of wonderful panelists that will, who are subject matter experts on the topic. And now let me take the opportunity to introduce you to our moderator, a gentleman who has years of experience behind him in sport. He has coached both male and female football teams. He has coached track and field. He's my friend, one of my mentors. Let me welcome our moderator for this evening's webinar, none other than Mr. Howard Spencer. Howard, welcome. Hey, thank you for that introduction, Ian. So we are here to do our third webinar. University sport and its importance. Ian spoke about our panelists this afternoon and the wealth of knowledge they have. And I am sure that you will be quite informed, well informed this afternoon from the information that they have to share with us. We have, we have international speakers with us this afternoon. We have with us Alim Rashid Malouf Neto. Now, Alim is the president of the International University Sport Federation, FISU of America, since 2016. And I have to be slow in my deliberations because Alim asks me to be slow so that he will understand. Alim is also the vice president of the Brazilian Confederation of University Sports since 2013. He's also a member of the Executive Committee, Committee of FISU since 2016. He's FISU Futsal Technical Director since 2012. He's the president of South America University Sports Confederation from 2008 to 2016. Alan is the Secretary of State for Sport in the state of Maranhão, Brazil, 2009 to 2015. He's also the General Secretary of the Brazilian Confederation of University Sport, CBDU, since 2008. He's the Vice President, Academic Federation of Maranhense Sport, 2003 to 2004. He's the president of the Futsal Federation of Maranhao, 2009 to 2017. He has an MBA in law, civil law, and civil procedure. And he also has an MBA in sport management, Olympic Committee of Brazil. Alim, welcome to Trinidad and Tobago. Hi, Howard. Good evening, my friends. I would like to say that it's an honor for me to be part of this webinar and uh, have a chat with our friends from Trinidad and Tobago. I'd like to congratulate the University of Trinidad and Tobago and TISAT for the initiative of this event. Thank you, Alim. Our second panelist, the lone female with us this afternoon, Donna Marie Wickham. Donna Marie Wickham has been a national swimmer since the age of nine. She's a multiple medalist from the CARIFTA, CISU, and SECAN Swimming Championships. She 
We competed at the CAC Games and also a semi-finalist in the Pan Am Games. She obtained the Amateur Swimming Association of Trinidad and Tobago's Swim of the Year Award in 2007. Donna Marie attended an, attained an academic and swimming scholarship from Limestone College. There she attained her BSc in athletic training, a minor in business. Ms. Wickham was the first female swimmer in the history of Limestone College to gain all American honors. She was also a multiple national and college record holder in the backstroke event. Ms. Wickham has never exited sport and has worked with several teams, including the national under 20 boys football team, the national women's senior football team, Guyana's national senior football team, St. Kitts and Nevis Patriot for the Caribbean Premiership, Premier League, CPL, as well as with other organizations. Donna, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here representing you, Mr. Transvego. Thank you, Donna. The gentleman I'm going to introduce is well known. He is Mr. Ephraim Serrett. Ephraim has been a member of the National Association of Athletics Administration, the NAAAs, executive for the past 15 years. In 2005, he was appointed third vice president and two years later was elected to the post of president, a position which he currently holds. A former national junior and senior sprint champion, he was a recipient of a government scholarship in 1978 to study in the USA, where he was enrolled and graduated from Fairleigh Dickinson University, TNX, New Jersey. While at university, he had great success, both at indoor and outdoor track events, and left the institution holding many indoor and outdoor meet records along the East Coast. Upon graduation, I permitted to train in Tobago and settled into the world of work after officially retiring from competition in 1984, but never kept far from the track and field circuit. In 2017, he was inducted into the University Hall of Fame. Ephraim, welcome. Thank you very much, Howard, and it's indeed a pleasure to be part of this distinguished panel to share the topic this evening on unit, university sport. Thank you, Ephraim. Uh, Next gentleman I have to introduce Mr. Ian Carter, Sr. Ian has been the Director of Student Life and Athletics at the College of Science, Technology, and Applied Arts of Trinidad and Tobago, COSTAT, for the past 10 years, where his responsibilities include athletic career management, health and counseling, student governance, and registered student organizations. He had brought a wealth of knowledge and experience in sport to the position that he currently holds and was instrumental in the development of the Costat Run for Life 5K. Ian has worked for many years as a track and field coach, coaching lecturer, fitness instructor, and sprint administrator. He's a certified World Athletic Formula IAAF Academy Sprint and Hurdles Coach, and has lectured regionally at the World Athletics Coaching Education and Certification System. As a physical fitness instructor, he has worked with both men and women, national te hockey teams at major international championships. As a track and field coach, Ian has worked with national teams at both the junior and senior level and served as the head coach of the 2016 Olympics and the 2017 and 19 World Track and Field Games. Ian currently serves as a vice president of the Tertiary Sport Association of Trinidad and Tobago, TSAT. Ian, welcome. 
Thank you, Howard, for the introduction. Um, good night, everyone. Uh, I really feel honored to be here, and I'm truly looking forward to the discussions that will follow. The next gentleman is a gentleman I had the pleasure of interacting with while he was at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Timothy Derry. Timothy Derry attended the University of Trinidad and Tobago, where he completed a bachelor's degree in education, physical education specialization, followed by an executive master's degree in sport management in 2017. His love for sport has seen him play almost every sport possible at the university level. He also pursued a referee and now operates at the TT Pro League level with high hopes of being a FIFA referee by the year 2021. His passion for helping others has led him to be an active volunteer for sporting and other activities. In 2017, he was selected to represent TSAT, the Tertiary Sports Association of Trinidad and Tobago, and his country at the FISU Volunteer Leaders Academy in Russia, where he had the distinguished honor of first place among 110 students from 109 nations. Since then, Timothy has attended the said event in 2018 and 2019 as a mentor to new participants and was asked to be a mentor again in this year's edition. Timothy, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Spencer for the lovely introduction. Good night to all. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking and, forward to the discussions. And while, and while you're at that, Timothy, uh, Howard will do, okay? <laughs> sure, no problem. So ladies and gentlemen, we, you heard the bio of all these wonderful people, these panelists, and we want to get straight into the discussion. But before getting into the discussion, I would like to tell, let you know that we have a special guest with us this afternoon. A gentleman that needs no introduction. And you will hear from him, that gentleman. Once you have anything to do with football in Trinidad and Tobago, you would have heard that gentleman's name. Alvin Cornell. Alvin, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, with this wealth of knowledge that we have with us this afternoon, we would like to get straight into the conversations. Before we do, I came across a little note from Connie Rogers, American College of Sports Medicine. And this is what she said. Sport programs benefit colleges and universities in multiple ways. When Leonardo da Vinci created his Vitruvian man, he showcased how the human form embodies the principle of architecture at its peak of perfection. He also revealed that the body and its abilities are just as vital to intelligence as is the mind. College, university sports embodied this concept. They showcase athletic intelligence alongside academic victories, from better student grades to strong community roots. College, university sport provides the gears that run universities. Sport teams can bring in millions in revenue, raise enrollment, and help secure strong alumni networks through sport programs. Can you, Rogers? So gentlemen and ladies, as I said, we'd like to get straight into the discussion this afternoon. And I know we have a lot of information to impart. And I would first like to go international. And I would like to invite our friend, Aleem. And Aleem, you are a gentleman who wears many hats. President of Peace of America, 
and you're also the Vice President of Brazil Confederation of University Sport. Could you share with us anything about university sport and its importance in your native Brazil? Well, uh, Howard, uh, the university sport in Brazil has uh, 81 years of history. Today, about 4 million students practice sports in Brazilian universities. This practice is encouraged and promoted by the Provincial University Federation that affiliates to CBDU. The Brazil is a, a long country. You have 27 provinces, states, and the, these provinces are affiliated to CBDU. And CBDU operates in regional and national level in 32 sports. And we have a participation in the, our competition in our national championships, around of 200,000 student athletes. The BDU now is a member of the National Sports Council and also linked in, in, uh, of the Brazilian Olympic Committee. The CBDU was a partner of the Brazilian Olympic Com Committee. And it's very important to say the 78% of the athletes who competed in the Olympic participants participated in, the, in CBDU events as well 58% of the medals won by Brazil in the Olympic in the Olympics uh, participation in our uh, movement in the competition of CBDU CBDU is Brazilian National University Federation uh, today we are honored to be uh, it's a, it's a, our country's greatest sports authorities and guidelines in this thing of our country we stay with a member of the sport Council, we stay together of this national level of uh, of a government and our discussions about sport, the university sports stay involvement and we stay uh, work for the our student athletes and the government of the Brazil. Thank you, Ali. Um, and Ali was said to us that you know seventy percent of the students of the Olympic student, Olympic athletes have actually passed through the university sport program. And that's quite a feat. So we have a Brazilian perspective. And I'd like to go to where everyone knows. Then I go to the American system. And Ephraim, I'd like to go to Ephraim. And Ephraim, as you mentioned in your bio, you were a recipient of a government sports scholarship in 1978 to study in the US. And you enrolled and graduated from Farley Dickinson University, New Jersey. Could you tell us what was it like studying in the US through the sport scholarship? Um, thank you, Howard. For me, I, I should say it was a unique experience for me. And to put it into context, in 1977, haven't been achieving being the national junior and senior sprint champion. And at the time I was also holding the national junior record. I was being sorted after by a number of schools. And uh, back then the government of Trinidad and Tobago used to award two sports awards, and one male, one female. And in 1978, I was fortunate to we offered that scholarship. While participating at the Commonwealth Games in, in Edmonton, I was approached by a member of the Board of Trustees of the Fairly Dickinson University in Teaneck. And I had been approached by a number of schools prior to that. And um, he did promise that they were building a track team. They were build, now building their track team and he would send for me to visit. So in January of 1978, I would have visited the school. I was accepted and I came back home and uh, had a conversation with my, my dad. And we had to make a, a decision as to where do I go? And the, what we came up with was that the other schools that were interested were schools that were known and my father felt that I would have been lost in those systems. We would have been just another one of those athletes. So we decided to go to the school that was going to build. Um, so I went, I chose to go to Fairleigh Dickinson. Great experience. Um, for me, the idea 
yeah, what my father was thinking of did happen, going there, doing well and establishing um, yourself, myself as, as you know, one of the previous printers at the school. Very interestingly, uh, we had a very small team. We had just about 15 members on our team. So the coach who was Rush Rogers at the time, we were a US Olympic coach, and um, his focus was on quality, not quantity. So in the first two years at the college, we had great success. I mean, for me, um, what was, was, was good is that the, the system that they had in place for the, for the, for the sport, the athletes, uh, we were well taken care of and looked after. And when I say that, not just physically and mentally, but school-wise. So we were, we were guided in the areas of study that we were, we were, we were um, doing. And at any given time, they would know exactly what's happening in school so that they would source. If you had problems in a particular subject matter, they would get tutors and they would always assist you because one of the main thing was to graduate. So we had a, a very interesting time. So the team consists of people from, we had people from Barbados, Guyana, we had a couple of Americans, some Africans from Kenya, Tanzania, and other parts of Africa. So it was exciting for me meeting these people, different system, traveling every weekend to competitions, different competitions you're meeting. So it's not like home here where you compete against the same people every weekend. So you get different level of competitions and then they have the area area championships. Then the, they go to the, the NCs, which was the, the big competition. So both indoor and outdoor. But the, for me, the interest was always focused on the education part. That was, that, was, that was key. And at that institution, they assured the athletes that that support was there. So we had support, we had mentorship, and we had everything to, you know, to, 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 to work with coach-wise, uh, trainers and everything. So the, on, well, I, I would probably later on, I'll probably make the comparison as to what happens locally. Um, because Yes, we, we had four years to, 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 to graduate. It was a four-year program. But they would have always give us the opportunity because some people may not have had that ability based on the number of credits that they would have needed. And in some, uh, some semesters, you would have had to, to take just sufficient classes to be matriculated. So that means at the end of the four years, you may not have accumulated your required number, at the time it was 124 credits, but the school would give the opportunity for that additional year for, for people to finish school. So that the experience for me was, was, was a good one. It was different from, I mean, leaving Trinidad at what, 19 years old and um, going into this system where um, competition every weekend, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, to mix that with the education. But for me, the support that was provided for the athletes was, was, was great. The support that was there, the mentorship, so that we, we, at that time, we, we, we didn't have people who did not complete. It was, you had to complete school, it was a must. But, I, I think it was a, a unique experience for me because being on a government scholarship, it, it meant that I, I had the opportunity to choose my competition. I, 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 you know, I was like a walk-on on the team. So I could have choose competition, but I, was, I enjoyed it so much that I, I would have gone to all the competitions and it worked for me. And I think um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed my four year stay at the university. Thank you, Ephraim. And you know, Ephraim, in his modesty, he didn't mention to you that he still holds the record for the 100 meters at Farley Dickinson of 10.20 seconds. 
And also the 55 meters of 6.12, is that correct, Ephraim? Yeah, yeah, that is correct. And the indoor record may not be broken for a while because they are now going to the 60 meters. So that was 55 meters back then. So that, that record may hold unless they go back to 55 meters. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. So we got a perspective from Brazil and we got one from the US. So it's only fair that um, we we'll try to find out something as to what pertains to Trinidad. And Ian, I would like to ask you, you know, you have been the director of student life and athletics at COSAT for the past 10 years. While COSAT is just a tertiary and maybe not a university, could you share with us what the sporting life is at that institution? Well, thanks, Howard. And so CASAT is a, a unique institution in a unique niche of the tertiary institution market. And we, are, we, are, we have been in, in existence for, this year would make it 20 years. And we are set up as a community college. Now, we are a multi-campus institution. And Oddly enough, you should ask me that question because we, as a multi-campus institution, we do not have much sporting facilities. And so we have to do things in very uh, innovative ways um, to be able to have sport and intramural and so on at, at Costa. Now, our population also is unique. And so, for instance, only about 35% of our students are full-time, right? And our population also is made up largely of uh, females at about 65 to 70%. So again, the mix of sports that we offer again um, is somewhat unique. And because we don't teach uh, sporting disciplines at, at Costat, whether it be uh, sport management or sport science. Uh, we don't. And so we don't recruit student athletes. So anyone who represents Costat really is a walk on. And, and we, are, we have been fortunate and we have been um, truly appreciative of our students who, who simply present themselves to represent us at, at, at the competitions. And so in order to have intramurals done, we've done so in one day format. So for instance, if, if we have football intramurals, we would have done that as a one day tournament. And because we have a campus, for instance, in Tobago and, and a, a fair percentage of our students are seven days Adventists, we, we tend to choose a Sunday to try and have a, a, a really inclusive event where all our students could participate because we recognize the importance of sport. And in trying to determine how we really um, provide a, a mix of sport, um, 10 years ago, we really came up with the idea of um, having sport included as part of the whole health and wellness um, drive that we had at Costat. And that's when the uh, Run for Life 5K was booted. And, and so this year would have been our 10th year. But unfortunately, because of COVID, um, we didn't have it at the usual time. However, we will move to a virtual format and ensure that we have our Run for Life 5K. And so it's become somewhat of a community event and it's, it, it's well established on the running calendar. And we would have started many years ago with 54, uh, 64 competitors and, and now we've moved up closer to 700. And so we have a large mix and we've also included other universities and so as part of, and um, we provide prizes and, you know, we encourage other universities to compete as well. But largely we've competed in the TSAT leagues. And again, we, we've tried to, come to, to, to take part in all these sports, you know? And interestingly, a couple of years ago, the Chinese government, um, they contributed table tennis boards and uh, badminton nets and posts and rackets um, to cost that. 
and we we moved them to the different um, different sites. And table tennis has picked up immensely in in Costa, particularly at the city campus. And um, so it's, it's it's really one of the ways that we have been able to encourage some level of activity as far as sport is concerned. Thank you, Ian. You know, I, I am happy that, that at this institution that you have been able to get all these sporting activities going while you do not have really sport at sport athletes or sport students actually come into your institution. You know, so that's a, that's a step in the right direction. And, you know, you mentioned also that the, you had a lot of women, right? So that might, could have been a hindrance. But our lone woman on the panel this afternoon, Donna. Donna, you were a recipient of academic and swimming scholarship. Share with us life and experience as a student athlete at Limestone. Hi, Howard. Okay. Um, so when I was 17, I, I did my SATs and whatnot, and I decided that I, okay, I studied management of business, economics, accounting, and I just really did not see myself sitting down behind a desk for the rest of my life. I mean, also because I was an athlete and I actually always had an interest in therapeutic measures to improve myself. So I said, you know, why not? I mean, I received a partial academic and at the scholarship, why not go? And I decided I was gonna study at the training with a minor in business studies. Um, as mentioned before, I studied at Limestone College, South Carolina, and uh, I was a collegiate swimmer. And for those un unaware what athletic trainers do, um, they basically um, help to provide services for the prevention, examination, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation of emergent acute or chronic injuries and medical conditions. So um, being, a, being a student athlete though was, it was very tough at times because it was, my major was very, very demanding. Um, so basically I have trained, I have to go from the pool or gym to lectures, to the athletic training room to do hours because you have to practice what you're learning as well, you know? Um, then back to the pool, um, it was a lot, but actually just made me who I am, you know? Um, as mentioned, I was the first NCAA Division II All-American in swimming for my college. Um, you make friends with different nationalities. Um, you also learn to have patience, you learn to have tolerance, you learn to be more accepting. And we also had fun. And it also taught you to be more team oriented as well too. Um, they try to say that swimming is a individual sport, but it's very heavily dependent on being a team member, a team player. Um, every action that you make, it affected the rest of the team. Um, even in a relay, um, every person, you have to build points that eventually go into a team score. So each person has to work hard to ensure that the team got the best possible result. So it actually being part of that team as well, you know, it helped to the application of my work life. And honestly, being a part of even this committee of the organization of this symposium, you know, we had to work together to ensure what we, what we as UGT are producing right now. And it gives me a sense of like being, going through all that and going through that experience, you know, has me as well, has me, has me happy to be part of another university, University of Transylvania, and I'm very proud to be part of this university's high performance and success unit team. Thank you, Donna Marie. So we've had, um, you know, expressions from Brazil, as I said, US, we got something about a little bit of Trinidad and Tobago. Donna Noaki, Donna came, gave us something about back in the US and her exploits. But this young man 
Mr. So Timothy Derry. As I said, you know, I had I, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to see him involved in sporting activities at UDT. And just what he said, he, he took part in almost every sport. Uh, he loves football. I'll put it this way: he loves football. You know, one year he he won <laughs> he won the Golden Boot in our inter-campus competitions, so scoring the most goals in the competition. So Timothy, you know, you attended UTT, where you completed a bachelor's degree in education, followed by an executive master's degree in sport. Now you were not a student athlete per se, but you were, at, you were a student who was involved in all the intra-campus activities. Timothy, could you tell us what was your university experience at UGT from a sporting perspective? Uh, thanks again, Howard. It'll be the first time I've, I've called you, Howard. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. Um, it was really good. I mean, uh, after leaving secondary school and coming into university, it was a big jump. Uh, everything was different about it. The workload, the different types of classes, the lectures. Um, if I'm being honest, it was uh, pretty difficult at first, but um, participating in sport uh, helped me a lot in terms of, um, and Donna mentioned some of the benefits just now, and also to relieve stress, to restore energy levels, to improve my mood. Um, it also helped me to socialize with others and make um, friends because in the classroom setting, you don't get the chance to interact with people as much as you do with sport. And it also helped me to maintain a decent level of fitness. As you mentioned, I was a lover of sport. So from my first year in university, I wanted to get involved in everything. So I started playing, training with the cricket and the football teams. Um, I played with ball cricket, hardball cricket, beach soccer, volleyball in the auditorium. Every time we had a free period, I was uh, involved in some type of uh, extracurricular activity. Um, at the end of my university years, I was fortunate enough to help my teams to win a couple of titles, uh, as you mentioned, to win a golden boot. Um, I still have it on my, on my um, shelf. I look at it every week. <laughs> um, but uh, another, another important factor beside all of this, uh, which helped me in my everyday life, is it helped me to develop my time management skills, uh, which is very important because I wanted to play sport in university, but I knew that I had to get a lot of work done. So I had to find a balance. Um, and I could tell you for sure that participating in university sports certainly didn't affect my education in any negative way. Thank you, Timothy. Yes, I know you did enjoy, you did enjoy life at, at, at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And what I'm trying to do here is just show the different aspects of life at the university level to see show eventually how important university sport is. And our special guest this afternoon is Mr. Alvin Cornell. And Alvin, you have you have heard these presenters and you have heard the Brazilian perspective, the American, and you heard what pertains in Trinidad to be. What 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 have you made of all this? Okay, Howard, good evening and uh, thank you for inviting me. I really do appreciate it. I am also very enthusiastic when we've got foreigners coming in to tell us different things in terms of what they've done. The Brazilian guy, welcome to you, sir. And then, of course, uh, there was uh, all the panelists. I felt very proud to know that these guys, these people have done as well as they have. We've reached a stage in university life where we've got to, to sit down and think a little bit more than the days when Ephraim went or when the years ago simply because of the fact that while the, the achievement of performances academically and athletically in the United States and other parts of the world, I say other parts of the world because I did not study in the United States. I taught in the United States, but I studied out in, in Leipzig and Germany and in England at Loughborough College. However, we need to look carefully at the development of our nation through the university system. And I think this is vitally important, if only because of the fact 
that all the good we have done, and we've done a lot of good for a small country, but out of all of it, we've not really prepared methodically from the early stages, from the embroiled stages of ch childhood in through the system of schools. We have not worked very hard on the development of communities. And we have done well. But consider, if we had done the right things in the early stages, where these kids were brought up methodically, not only from the primary school stage and going into the secondary schools and then to the university, we may have found ourselves a lot more forward than we are at this present time. That does not say that we have not done well. I started this, this university system, um, getting kids in in my academy. We were 50 years last year. And over the years, it, bo it bothers me to understand that we are sending those kids to the States. Now, it was easy because we've got a good academic system here, particularly in the colleges and secondary schools. In those days, the United States universities, they did not put a hard claim on accepting a student. So long as you went into the different grades in the system, you could be eligible to enter the student. But after a time, they started to put an SAT test to it and say, you've got to get two or three or four subjects. And the thought of scholarship came up in a big, big way, I'm sure. Um, people like Wendell Motley and, and Kent Bernard and from Serret and all the others, they've been through the system and they have done extremely well. We are fortunate because they've come, those have come back. Kent Bernard's not back. Edwin Roberts is not back. Wendell Motley was out there. He came back after a time. What we have done is that all the potential, all the material that we have that was aiming at potential they were allowed into the university system. And they were allowed in the university system and did extremely well. That's typical of our people. But when it came to making a decision as to where do we go from here, we've only had 20 to 25% of those students who have gone to the United States from returning home. And that is painful. Not that we could have done anything better because we only had UE, we didn't have UTT at the time and so on. So I'm looking into the system whereby we could develop our students from the primary stage into the secondary, into the tertiary stage in terms of getting a well-grounded individual. It also has to do with community life where kids are supposed to develop in communities, not only just arbitrarily, but with the attention of people who are qualified to deal with them at different areas of their lives. Yes, we've got athletes, that's great. But think of an athlete, if he had been really taught about what he was doing in whatever sport, when he was growing six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In those years, all they did in the primary schools, and they still do it, they said, let's, let's have a game of football, let's have a game of cricket, let's have a game of anything, that's fine. The joy of it is great. But is the, is the, the, the development of it helpful? Are we there to, to help these kids to guide their destiny, destiny in terms of their physical development, in terms of their understanding of what they're doing, rather than just going and having a good time? I think that that is where the University of, of Trinidad and Tobago could make a, an integral jump into society, not only here, but in the outside world. We have now got the students, we have them, they come to the universities here, but it, whenever they were going out there, they stayed out there most of the time. Some of those guys are, are, are lecturers, some of those, they, you talked about um, Fairley Dickinson, um, um, he, he will know that our students were lecturers there, our students were associate, uh, associate um, lecturers there, and they benefited from it. And I'm saying that now we have the opportunity to develop a nation. We have the opportunity, not just to let them participate and hope that they do well. We must make the demand. They want to play, fine. We're going to facilitate you, but we're going to facilitate you with information. We are not going to allow it to run away from your academics. We are going to have you work it in time. We're going to help you to understand the development 
much more than just going out and play. And this was one of my, my pet peeves, simply because of the fact that I felt that these guys, I have sent so many of them. Incidentally, I sent 538 kids to universities in the United States for free. But you know what? About 30% of them came back. They're all over the world. Some are doctors, some are this, some are that, some are the other. So I, in the business of development, Howard, we are here and we have to sit down and think and talk about it seriously enough. We must also look at, if you have engineers as, as, as lecturers as engineers and in agriculture and in management and in so on, why can't you have tutors and educators of sport? I'm talking about that university level. Why do we have to go in the outside world in Cuba to get somebody to t teach us something about this? Why do our athlete, uh, athletes like Ephraim and everybody else go out there to the United States? Why can't we educate them? Edwin Roberts is out there. He is a tutor of it. Kent Bernard is out there. He is a tutor of it. We have got to look at this very carefully and develop a method whereby we could run this from one state into another. I don't think it's difficult. I've done it. I've done yeah. it with a lot of kids. And I, I just want to share with you that this should be yeah. our intention for the future. Okay, Alvin. Okay, Alvin. Um, a lot of food for thought there. As a matter of fact, you made a strong plea. Ad, ad, you are actually advocating for a system in Trinidad and Tobago where we can actually take the university sports and these athletes forward. And there are some other questions here that I'd like to ask. And I'll let you remember that because I'm going to come back to you later when we start doing the, when we are looking to see where can we go. But I want to ask, I want to ask um, our good friend, Alim, you know, because we hear about all these, you spoke about 78% 70, of your athletes taking part in what you have as your university sport program in Brazil. So, Alim, you know, the president of the International Federation wrote greetings earlier. What can you tell us about FISU America? Sorry, uh, the FISO America is the, the, the entity to coordinate and promote university sports in our continent. We have 28 affiliate national federations. Our federa uh, FISO America have only 13 years old, it's a younger uh, uh, federation. And we held the FISO America Games in even years. Our last edition was held in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and have a participation of 13 countries and 1,600 participants in 12 sports. Next edition will be held uh, in this year, but we postponed it to 2022 for Merida, Mexico, uh, because the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next year, 2021, we have four Pan American Championships and the like sports is futsal, basketball, free for free, football, and we'll have launched in the next month the, the Rugby Sevens. This last three is being classified the World Cups promoted to FISU. Uh, we have a, a continental competition and all the other continentals have your tournaments and the, the best two. And each continental goes to the, the final World Cup for these sports in the FISU level. Uh, I'm very ha happy to see that FISO America is a pioneer in holding e-sports events. These years, we had a complement the situation of the FISO, the COVID-19. We held the first FISO, FISO America e-sports uh, in the FISO level with the FIFA platform. An event with participation of 36 athletes in 15 countries of our continent. For the first, the first time in the FISO history, you have one online competition, e-sports competition. Uh, it's important to say we have educational events and we already have uh, held three forums and this year, next, this year we have uh, discussed about the post-COVID activities in November. We have an uh, online FISO America forum. We have all the members of the FISO America and the FISO 
and the universities we we will discuss about the what what can I do in the sports in the uh, the period post COVID. Uh, we have another activity, the dialogue strategy, and our where our national federations, the FISO America, and the FISO, we have a guidelines uh, outlined the strategy and discussed discussed sorry discussed the development of the world university sports next year. Next year, this event is in Santiago de Chile in April. It's a very important moment. You, you have a, 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 a very panelist you stay together to discuss the sports, the university sports in our continent and our world. Thank you, Alan. So what you, actually say, what you have actually said is that there's an entity that promotes all these uni university sports in well, in the world, but you are just, you talk about Peace of America. But you know, I will, I, what I would like to find out, and, and Ian, maybe you could come in here and, and tell us. Um, you are currently the Vice President of TISA, Tertiary Sport Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Enlighten us as to what this entity what is this entity called TSAT? Okay, so TSAT, as Alim said, uh, TSAT really is part of uh, FISU America, but the wider body is, is FISU, which is the, uh, the international body. And um, TSAT was, became a member of FISU, I think it was in 2013. And FISU holds both summer and winter games. Now, FISU, they, they, these uni, universidad, I think they call it, they're the second largest uh, multi-sport games next uh, after the Olympics, right? And in fact, um, I think they, they re FISU is responsible for something like over 50 um, different sporting federations. So TSAT, we competed in several summer games. So uh, the last two we would have attended would have been last year. We would have competed in the World University Games in um, Naples. And, and, and the one before that was in um, Taiwan. And we, we started with really small teams. And, and you have to understand that funding is always a, a problem for, um, for TSAT. And but last year in Naples, we won our very first medal, which was a silver medal in shot, uh, shot put through Porsche's Warren, you know. And so we, we've come a bit and we've engaged in different sports as well. We've, we've competed in swimming at, at World University Games, Taekwondo last year, and um, table tennis. Now, TSAT, we have about 10 um, member tertiary institutions in, in, in TSAT. And TSAT is responsible for running mostly the tertiary leagues. And, and, and we've done leagues in uh, wind ball, cricket, uh, T20, you know, soccer, both men and women, um, basketball, um, volleyball, just, just, just to name a few. And we've also sent um, a couple of students, um, Mr. Derry was one of our recipients to the FISU Volunteer Leaders Academy where we, we've really done um, very well. I think by now, Mr. Derry is a, uh, uh, he's well known in the, um, in the academy having um, done extremely well by being the top student and they've invited him back um, as a mentor um, subsequently. And so we're really responsible for the tertiary institution sports. But Howard, you know, um, there's a, I, I think there's a void in sport between um, secondary school and, and you know, the, the national leagues and so on. And another institution, um, TSAT is really trying to fill that void and to encourage students <clears throat> um, to continue in sport, even at the tertiary level. Because we recognize um, the important role that sports plays in in, in, in tertiary um, in tertiary education and uh, we recognize there's a lot that we can learn through sport and you know a, a lot of skills that were unnecessary taught in the classroom 
But um, you know, the sporting field is certainly a, an, an important place where we can learn a, a lot of lessons. And for instance, Ephraim and, and, and um, Timothy would have alluded to some of those things they would have learned, um, you know, having engaged in sport at, at the tertiary level. So TSAT, we, we will definitely be trying to fill that void between secondary school and um, those national competitions. Thank you, Ian. But what I gather from what you said, Ian, that uh, there is there is an entity in Trinidad that is willing to take uh, university sport forward. Once that we have the system here that is well organized and well oiled and great. Uh, you did mention something about Timothy Derry and the Leaders Academy. Now, Timothy. And I'll jump in here because, because we know that sport builds leadership qualities, right? And Timothy, you know, you said you were selected to represent TSAT and by extension, Trainer Tobago at FISU Volunteer Leaders Academy in Russia. Where you had a distinguished honor of being placed first among 110 students from 109 countries. So here it is, we had a representative from our twin island state of Trinidad and Tobago, small as we are, at the Academy of Volunteers, and being placed first and also being invited back, and that was 2017. So he was invited back 2018 and 2019 to the same leadership academy to be a mentor to those volunteers. So they must have seen in you, Timothy, some outstanding leadership qualities. Tell me, how did your participation in sport at UTT contribute to the development of those qualities? Thank you, Howard. <laughs> the second time. Oh uh, yeah, for the second time. Um, and um, Mr. Carter mentioned uh, just a correction. Uh, FISU has 174 member federations across five different continents, so it's, it's quite a large um, organization. Um, I was actually. It's been four successive occasions I've been asked, well, three since the first, I've been asked to be a mentor and team leader. Um, the last was this year. Uh, the first session was in June. Uh, it was an online session because um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the participants weren't able to travel to Russia. So they had an online forum just two days in June and it's going to be continuing two days in September also. Um, my past experiences, yes, the organizers have personally told me that they were impressed by my leadership qualities. Uh, I think participation in sport at university contributed in many different ways. Um, I think I work well in groups and teams, uh, being part of different sport teams at university. I developed, as I mentioned before, time management skills. I learned how to deal with different personalities um, becoming better socializing with others. Um, I was captain and vice captain of, of different teams at different points. So you had to know how to interact and to get the best out of people um, uh, to have good team performances. In addition to those, I also had the responsibility. Howard bestowed upon me the responsibility to organize different things for teams um, when we had training sessions and matches. Um, Simple things like organizing equipment and uniforms, um, drinks for the teams, different things. So uh, because of that, I also learned how to delegate responsibility to others, uh, which I think is a critical leadership skill. And I was never one, Howard would tell you, I was never one to run from responsibility. I was always one uh, you could have counted on to get something done. And I think, um, Sport has played a, a very big part 
in my development in, in, in that regard. Thank you, thank you, Timothy. You know, I, I want to continue. I want to continue on the same trend. Because Ephraim, you have been you have been a leader of, of the entrepreneurs for the past thirteen years. Thirteen years. You know, um, tell me, Ephraim, how was how was your sporting career at university molded you for this or helped you to this position? Um, for me, well, I, I will mention a, a number of things there, um, which had me thinking, um, you know, even prior to me leaving to, to go to university, uh, you know, having that formal training and understanding what I was doing. And while he was speaking about that, I remember at my induction a couple of years ago, 2017, the coach of the team was present for that, Mr. Rogers. And he came because um, he wanted to make the presentation to me. And his opening words, I mean, I, I, I'm not too proud of it, but his opening words were, he, don't, he, he, didn't, he don't know, this is what he said, he, he don't know what Ephraim said would have done if he was serious about track and field. <laughs> because for me, the sport was fun. I was having fun, actually. I was having fun enjoying the sport, and um, it, it, it was working for me. But as the eldest in a family of seven, I was always called upon to, to lead. Um, so we had teams in the area. At 16, I, I organized a football league in, in, in the community, so I was in charge of that. Um, you know, at, at school in the university, I was team captain. Uh, I was also responsible for organizing uh, because my school was in Teaneck, New Jersey. So like we would have arranged to have some of the high schools, you know, come visit, see us train, come to meets and in order to build the, the university, you know, to get people attracted to the university, to the sport and all of that. But um, I came from a background where there was always this leadership thing. So like my, my father used to be the president of the welfare association in the community. My mom was in charge of a, a, a class in the community. So we were always kind of, you know, there were always leaders around. My uncle um, was leader in steel band movement. So it was all around. So it was just like, you know, following through. And I did it with, with ease. And, um, Coming back home and coming back to track and field, and, you know, based on the experience that I would have had gotten out there, and uh, to see what was happening with the track, that it, it hadn't moved anywhere. We were just doing some of the same things. And I, I, I used to go, we had this place we used to sit in the stadium and call Parliament. And, uh, Mr. Crawford said to me one time, he was on the board at the time, and he said, Cicero, you can't change anything from outside. You have to get it going. <laughs> and I, I offered myself, because at the time I had, I had the time, and I said, OK, I need to, to give back a plea. So I just think it right that I, you know, I should give back. I didn't think I'd have been still involved. but um, And it was just natural. So I, I got involved. I went on as the third vice president. I am a systems person, so I always like to organize and have things systems in place. After two years, the second year, after a three-year term, uh, the, the president would have resigned. And as third president, I felt that the first vice president might have been the next person to be move up to the office of president. But here, these people were, were looking at what I would have brought to the table, some of my suggestions, some of the systems that I would have uh, introduced, and I was elevated to president. And because I don't, I, I always say because of my sport, because of the area of my study, results are always important to me. So I always want to see change and what you know, what we you know. So one of the early things I started to, to prepare for was like constitutional reform, uh, incorporating the, the association as a business. Um, 
So, you know, all those things, but it took time because we have to bring people along. So we had to go out, we had to do the consultations. Uh, we had some great challenges. We had some people who felt they held that constitute, the old constitution close to their heart and the thing that we didn't need to change and, you know, but it happened and we continue to grow. I think during my tenure, I was able to bring a lot of sponsors on board because again, I see the sport as business. We have a, we have a product. So we have to sell our product. And that's how I have been using that to move our sport forward. We, we are now organized and we have a, a board of directors. So we have a business structure. So the sport um, and the discipline has helped me a whole lot in giving back to the sport and to help the younger athletes. And as I, I always say, um, they should not go through what we would have gone through in our early days. We're supposed to be leading and trying to help them and get, you know, to, to get out there. And Arvin would have said, I mean, the number of athletes who he would have assisted in getting scholarships. I mean, for me, people say, yes, they get scholarships, they don't come back and they, they win the Olympic medal. Everybody's not going to go to the Olympic. For me, my satisfaction is that if we can get the athletes, they get a scholarship, they graduate, and they have a better quality of life. That is a, a great accomplishment. So I, I continue to, to, to give my time back to the sport. Uh, the success, as my mother, my deceased mother would always say, take time. It don't, it don't happen. I think sometimes, sometimes I want to see things happen too quickly. And I just have to wait and bring everybody along so that we can you know, make the sport um, a, a better sport. And for, for us, it's, it, it, it's encouraging for me because over the last, what, seven years, in the last seven years, the First Citizen Sports Foundation administrators are here, or, or my association would have won that five times in the last seven years. So it, it says much. So it gives us the, that motivation to continue working and making change. Thanks, Ephraim. So we, so we definitely see we see a definite link between this university sport and leadership building leadership qualities. Um, there's another aspect I wanted to bring in um, as regards grades, because literature liter suggests that persons who are involved in vigorous activities seem to have a higher grade point average at the end, right? But it's now 910. And I want to bring in Donna at this point because we go to 930 and we still have questions from the from the audience. I want to go to Donna at this time. Donna, you know you worked at you work at DGT as a as a athletic trainer. Tell us something about, about UTT and the life at UTT because um, Alvin did mention UTT in his, in his presentation. Tell us something about, about sport and life at UTT. Okay, um, with regards to student athletes, I have two sides of it, you know, student athletes side and even being as a regular student. With regards to student athletes, um, you see fostered a similar environment to what I've experienced. Um, we have student athletes that were given residence in dorms and transportation to school, which is wonderful um, because my coworkers, Brenton Bain, Mickey Rubin, Angel Utley, and myself were positioned at the dorms so that athletes could do their rehabilitation, their strength and condition, and was, everything was convenient. Um, they were provide like athletes were provided just like the states, you know, provided with an education, um, and you had similar requirements to upkeep regarding grade point average, etc. Um, to me, um, Trinidad Tobago needs this opportunity to continue. Um, we have students from all over our country that can now, through sports, be afforded an, an academic opportunity as well. Um, in past, we have had at least from Grand River, Toko, Miaro, Tobago, et cetera. Um, and we need to at least have this opportunity to continue so that our youths have this option for the future. Um, 
they can be locally educated and trained in sports so that Trina wouldn't have to suffer. You know what we were speaking before, you know, I, um, Mr. Cornell and, and Mr. Sarah were saying, you know, people will go and not want to come back. And if we have these locally educated and trained people in sports, you know, we would have to suffer brain drain to the other countries, even to our regional neighbors. You know, we have the ability to really manufacture our own athletes and also create our own brilliant minds to, to um, our own brilliant minds to help further the progress of this country, you know. Even our inter-campus sports, you know, which is success units host, um, that regular students participate has had a positive effect. Students have learned team skills, leadership, patience, confidence, etc. It's translated into their schoolwork, personal development, and mental health. Um, I read an article some time ago. Someone said, you learn to compete and cooperate all at the same time. So university sport just fosters in positivity and is actually a very great character building, you know, situation for students to be involved in. Yeah, thank you, Donna. So Donna, you know, what we are actually saying, what, what we are actually saying here is that in Trinidad, we have a, we have a model similar to what you have experienced in, in the US. Right, so I, I, and you know, what I'd like to add to that, at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, I know that, that, that they have athletes there who have taken Trinidad on the map. Take, for instance, um, or volleyball in volleyball, we have moved from from 100, position 120 on the world rankings to 20. Through Francisco Cruz, our, our volleyball coach at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, right? We have instances where in netball, Samantha Wallace, and we have a lot of other national players who have passed through UTT. Darren Alfred. He is a UTT born track and, well, bred, not born, bred, track and field athlete. So we actually have a model in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago that we can build on. You know, I, I want to ask this question to all the panelists because we are running out of time and I'm going to ask the question to all the panelists, you know, and I'll start with, with Alim first. You know, Alim, you have heard about university sport in Trinidad, you know, and this is the question to everyone, what recommendations can you make to further develop university sport in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, first, first of all, uh, it's to make yourself know within the universities and your sports university in your country. The important thing is to have the vision of sports as a factor of the development of our students and the develop our university themselves. I give to you the example of the CBDU because for a long time ago, we had treated only our university world and all the administration of the universities. And now you have seeken the partnership with the Olympic Committee, National Federation, and the federal government. It's very important we stay together of these, these members. Uh, it's another important fact is to give a visibility of your activities. Today is essential the use of the networks, uh, the streaming of your games, but always focus on your student athletes to make him feel important and happy to play sports and representative your universities and your country. Another important factor is to be afraid to innovate. Uh, the young people is very heavy this innovation spirit. And I'd like to say that you will always have the Fiso America as a partner to continue to being to building and stronger the more united university sports. It's very important you stay united and the SAT and the university stay together to develop the university sports. Thank you, Alim. 
Uh, Timothy, you know, you, you have been, you have seen the world through university sport. What recommendations you have that we could take our sport to another level? Uh, Howard, first, I think the first thing we need to do is to educate students about the importance of sport and physical activity. Um, I don't think we grasp the, the importance or how important it is, um, not just at the university, but uh, in everyday life. If we don't have students wanting to participate in sport and sporting activities, then it's back to square one. So we could do, we can put on whatever we want to do, but if we don't have the student interest, um, it's back to square one. Um, and I think a way we could do that is to introduce them to some of the different benefits uh, they can achieve from being involved in a uh, healthy lifestyle. Apart from the physical benefits of participating in sport and recreational activities, there are many other um, mental and social benefits uh, that sport um, and play brings. For example, as you mentioned earlier, some researchers have said that um, being physically active, um, you, do, you have a better grade point average at the end uh, because physical activity helps to stimulate the mind and it's helped to improve academic performance. My master's thesis was actually on something similar. Um, my topic was the, the relationship between academic performance and aerobic fitness. I did it in one school in Trinidad and Tobago and it turned out that there was a positive relationship between the two. So, which means that those that were more, those are what the students that were fitter or those that participated in physical activity more did better and, and, and the an examination. Uh, so I think this is something that there's a big misconception about as a lot of people believe that when they're studying, they should only be focused on studying and not playing or exercising. This is why I believe that universities need to put their hand up. And I think you, uh, the UTT is doing it. And Mr. Carter said um, he's trying with, with Costa and take some responsibility for not putting sport and recreation high on the list um, to engage student perform uh, uh, participation. Because most of the universities focus on academics. They don't place sport as important and recreation. Um, I don't think now it's just about book work. We want the next generation of those around to start living healthy lifestyles. And to add to that, the skills that make for a good sportsman are also the skills that the employers are looking for now, uh, such as high motivation, um, having ambition, uh, being good team players, being good problem solvers. Uh, that, just to name a few. I think that the universities need to start holding sport events for their students to partake in. Uh, it might be a little far-fetched, but even um, I've, I've heard some recommendations from some of my friends about offering a couple of credits for participating in sport and extracurricular activities that might help to increase our student participation. Uh, universities can also make a sport and recreation course compulsory for all students um, throughout the, the, the university life. Um, with TSAT, um, I know that there's healthy intervarsity competition being run between some of the tertiary institutions. But the problem with that is that the same institutions that participate in football are the same ones that are going to do so in cricket and basketball. There's a core, maybe three or four institutions that participate in everything. And we don't get all the universities involved. So we need to come up with different ways um, to get them involved. And I think one of the recommendations to TSAT could be to start uh, maybe start uh, a student committee at the TSAT level. So we have students at the different universities um, and they would be the link between their university and TSAT. So TSAT would be able to hear the voice of the students and what their needs and wants are and what might be able to encourage them to participate in sport. Um, FISU, which is the International University Sport Federation, also has EDUS, which is the International Day of University Sport. Uh, it was proposed by FISU in 2016 and was officially endorsed by UNESCO. Uh, it is celebrated 
annually on the 20th of September. Now in Trinidad, we started celebrating this in 2018. That was after the first year of the FISU Volunteer Leaders Academy. Um, unfortunately, in 2019, it didn't uh, come off because of unforeseen circumstances. Hopefully, we can have it this year, uh, which was a planned um, football tournament and aerobics. So we have competition in the football tournament, but it's not just about competition because we want everyone to be involved. So we um, we have the aerobics for other students could just come and have fun. Maybe bring their mom, their dad, their children, just to have, come and have fun and free up their self. Um, during this day or this week of the International Day of University Sports, um, some universities across the world actually cancels all classes for the day and, and allocates the day for sport and recreation at the university. So anyone can come in and, and, and have fun. And I think it's something we can look at here in Trinidad. Um, I know it's a bit much and, and I think the people who are in charge of the university, some of them are a bit stubborn and, and, and don't think sport is important. So um, that would be a challenge, getting them on board. Uh, I think we also need to get more students involved with TSET uh, because without students and volunteers, we cannot have many events. And it's a challenge we're facing now, uh, one that we are working on. Uh, those are just some of the ideas that I have at, at this point. Thank you, Timothy. You said a lot, and um, you did mention, you did speak a lot about TSAT, and I wouldn't go to Yen right now. I, I want to go to Alvin. We go to Alvin was was saying quite a lot as to the way forward. So, Alvin, your recommendations for the way forward. Well, I I am I'm very impressed in listening to what the other people are saying because they've had some good experiences, they've had good opportunities, and so on. But I'm looking at the long, the, 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 in the future, simply because of the fact that I believe that our kids from the young stage, we should be, we should be taking them in hand and developing them to the process of secondary schools and tertiary education in the process of sport that will benefit us because they are starting at an earlier age and coming through from the primary school through the, the secondary schools and into the university. Why I'm saying this is because why is sport the thing that we really are suffering from in terms of sports education officers? Simply because of the fact that we take sport too casual in the primary school. At the secondary schools, they get good, but they do not get the kind of information that's going to take them that step further. All our athletes and all our famous players, they've been out to the United States and they've been getting information like nobody's business. We've had to fight our way. We had a few out there in football and cricket because cricket is a, is a British sport kind of thing. We had the opportunities there. But now we must set a pattern whereby what we were doing before is what we should change and start to get the, the primary school system, the kids in that age, the communities, the kids in the communities to sort of develop the skill, the natural skill first, and then the coaching in the secondary schools, and then the, the professional approach for when they start to study and, and, um, and play at the same time. I think Ian mentioned the fact that you, one needs the other. It is good for temperament, it is good for commitment, it is good for, for management. They all things match each other. And if you go on to that stage from the primary system, you must remember that we've got a lot of young kids waiting there, waiting to be a Hazley Crawford or waiting to be a Wendell Motley or anything like this, but they have not had the foundation. I am hoping that the university, and I think they, they probably are looking in the same direction as well, I'm hoping that they will take it in hand, work it methodically, and let's look at five years' time and see how it comes out. Thank you, thank you, Alvin. Plenty of food for thought. Um, and remember, those of you on YouTube, you can send in your questions. We should have some time to answer. Uh, Ian, Ian, um, 
Timothy said a lot of things about about TSAT and getting involved. Um, how can you go forward? Yeah, actually, you know, Timothy brought up a lot of um, very interesting things, and, and, and so did Mr. Cornell. But interestingly, you know, um, there's another view of sport at, at the tertiary level. As a matter of fact, Jay Co Co Coakley would have spoken about the great sport myth, and that in fact, what we think that sports does, it, it, it really doesn't, you know? And, and maybe it's because it's not, it's not really codified and maybe not even understood. And there's another point of view that the problem in tertiary, it's, uh, tertiary level sport is not the sport itself, but in fact, uh, it's um, bringing kids in to the institution through scholarships. And in fact, the money used for scholarships may take away um, money that could be spent on other things within the educational institution. Now, as an administrator, um, and uh, we all are sports administrators, sometimes we do not see ourselves as educators. And we need to understand as sport administrators, what are those educational things that we could bring to our students? Remember, we are dealing with tertiary level, in, um, tertiary level students. So we, we have to understand what it is we're trying to impart. And often we feel we are just imparting uh, physical skills. But in fact, we are also imparting life skills as well. And we really need to understand what we are, uh, are teaching our students. Now, as a member of, as the vice president of TSAT, organizationally, there are several things that we need to do. One of the main things we need to do is change our system a bit and become more of a board than an elected body. Um, so for instance, we would have problems when um, members of our organization move away from the tertiary institution. It leaves a void. And often, not all tertiary institutions are represented and, and therefore we need to move more to a board system. We need to get our presidents and our principals more involved and to understand what it is TSAT is trying to do as far as the development of sport is concerned in our institutions and what we're trying to bring to our students. Wider participation and, and Timothy would have mentioned it, we need wider participation. And that participation really comes with the intramural sport more so than the than the, the, the varsity sport. We need to have strong, a strong intra, intramural um, system that would feed into the varsity system. Um, we need to develop relationships, particularly with the NSOs. Um, so we've been fortunate to have gotten funding from um, the prime minister's office. So when we had to um, go to university games and we've been fortunate uh, to have the entries assist us with um, with uniforms and so, um, you know, so we need to really develop our relationship with those NSOs because we represent several different sport. Um, we may have to work a little backward to, de to develop some sort of nexus between the secondary school and um, we know, as Mr. Cornell said, that sport isn't taken very seriously, particularly at the primary school level. And only a small percentage of, of, of our students at um, secondary really get involved in sport. As a matter of fact, I, I recently saw a picture of um, some sportsmen who uh, went to school with me at Trinity College. And it's only then I, I realized that the only persons I remembered from Trinity College were the sportsmen. And that's the effect sports have. I, I really didn't remember these colors so well, but certainly these sportsmen I did. And so we really need to develop these relationships as a tertiary um, institution for sport that would assist us in really um, bringing these services that we need to, to our, our students at, at um, tertiary institutions. Thank you, Ian. Uh, you mentioned NSOs, so Ian, sorry, so uh, Ephraim. Yes, yes, I would. Um, generally, I, I am in agreement with Mr. With Alfred. We really have to start from the primary level. We are dealing with a society that only focuses on education. So before a child is born, the parents study which primary school and which secondary school. 
we all will fo only focus on the education. And I'm saying that to say, having grown up in, brought up in MOVA, my parents would have encouraged us education, we had play sport, we played steel band, we were involved with everything, best village, everything, all well wrongly. And I'm saying that to say, if it wasn't for the sport, I'm not too sure where Ephraim Shelter would have been. So that the sport, and as, as Alvin rightly said, we have to develop that from the primary level coming up into the secondary level and into the, into the tertiary, tertiary, level, tertiary level. Because in this, even in the secondary level, we have schools taking athletes to play sport, for football, they bring them in for football and exploit them. So they go in second form, they play football, and then they're on the same academic pathway as people who just doing academics. And then they, they finish the school, they don't get a proper education, there's no mentorship, there's no proper plan. I think if I, if I remember, there may be one principal who I think had a, a strategy, that might have been Mr. Augustine with uh, Mr. Donner, where he used to explain to the, the footballers, okay, well, they have five years, first year you concentrate on uh, three subjects or whatever it is, and they get the additional year to do another two to get a certificate and, you know, but that is not happening. The, the, the school, the system is looking to win. In the case of football, the intercal. And where are those, uh, those footballers or even some of the athletes? Where are they? We don't know what happened with them. But even in, even in, our, in our university, we had athletes who have gone to university here. And I don't, I'm not sure they understand what it takes to have that caliber of athletes at that level. Right now, we are facing a situation where the US is saying that athletes who are going to school out there, if they only have virtual classes, they will lose their F1 visas and that kind of thing. So I am not sure whether in Trinidad and Tobago, the tertiary level uh, institutions are looking at that because whether we are ready to have these people who may not be afforded the opportunity to go back to the US because of the whole pandemic and whether we, they would be able to be matriculated into a system here based on what they were studying and you know have them enter to the system here. I mean, in Jamaica, they have the, the front universities across there. And one of the things is, is that if we have teams here, in the case of track and field, the, the, the program has to be one where they they're going to cost some money because they would have to travel for me, as I see it, to meet across the region and even as far as the US. If we want to, if, we, if we've taken this thing seriously. Because while I was in college, yes, in New Jersey, but we travel every weekend to different parts of the US for competition. So we get in different levels of competition every time. So we, we have to look at the societal aspect of it in Trinidad and Tobago, parents, don't really understand the importance of sport and what sport can do. As I said, I, I from a family of seven, five boys, two girls, the five boys, we have all gotten athletic scholarships. There would, there's no way my parents would have been able to afford to send five of us to university. But because of sport, because of sport, we were able to, to do that. So is understanding our culture here and whether or not, and at the point about what is happening now, I think, is a great opportunity for the universities or the tertiary level institutions in Trinidad to look at that issue that is developing now where we have athletes who we may not be able to go back to the US to finish their studies based on what is happening. So sport, education and sport, it goes hand in hand. And I create a, a number of people when then what we was a, a, a big scholar, minister, you know, we have people, Dr. Baselins. We have quite a few people, I mean, who would have participated in sport and have done well and come back and contribute to the development of the children. Thank you, Ephraim. You know, and, and there's so much that, that that we wanted to talk about tonight, but 
Uh, we are way past our time and we still have our female alone female, that's the same. Then, and, uh, then we have questions from the for the from the viewing public. So Donna May, Donna Marie. Sorry. It's fine. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm just gonna keep that as short as possible. Um, I agree with everything, especially when you talk about, you know, starting this from young, from a primary school age. So to further develop, if we wanna really develop university sport, we have to start from young, not just at university itself too. And that's why I strongly believe that we have to have the proper and true investment into university sports, you know? We have to have administrators who have been involved and have the knowledge of what is required to run a successful program um, with new ideas and objectives to help it grow, you know. Um, as a national university here, um, we can and we have created athletes that have gone to successful lives. For example, you know, mentioned before in netballer, Samantha Wallace, you know, we have a designer, Daniel Clark. Um, also, we had cricketer Hayden oh, Walsh for a while. Oh, um, and we have been able to continuously put ourselves on the map and be the go-to destination for study and sport. Um, but I think with good administrators who have been involved and who have been through the process, who have known, you know, how we could take it forward, be very good, you know, for the promotion of, you know, sport in university, because we want to create athletes with an education, you know, we want to create athletes who are, you know, well-trained, well-educated and, you know, could have a future as well too and help to give back and put back into our country. Thank you, Donna. Um, you know, there's so much so many aspects of university life that 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 we really wanted to to show this evening. But you know we have recognized that, that the University of Trinidad and Tobago has has a model that is almost similar to to what pertains in the state, where students could come in on a, on a scholarship, transportation to, transportation to school, transportation to training. We have athletic trainers. We have strength conditioners right at the university. And it's a matter of maybe either further developing that or getting other universities involved. J.U. Gordon stayed at, at, at UE, right? So we have athletes who are willing to, to, to stay to stay here, but they need the right facilities. And then we just want to play, we want to play a clip at the end of this, this part of the session, a short clip of a uh, athlete who actually attended the University of, of Trinidad and Tobago. Hello, this is West Indian cricketer Hayden Walsh Jr. And I attended the UTT sports program from 2010 to 2011. Um, you know, it was a really good program for me because I was able to study, train and play at the same time, which helped set the foundation for my career up until now. Also, the facilities that um, we were training and playing in, they were the best in the Caribbean, I would say. And, you know, it it is a very good program for um, youngsters who really want to get, in, get into sport, whether they want to be an athlete or, you know, they want to get, get into sports medicine, etc. Um, so, you know, I really would urge the UTT to keep on laying that foundation and keep on building um, great athletes. So that was Courtney Walsh Jr. The latest find in the CPL, right? He did have a stint at, at the university and he was just endorsing what happened there. So we'd like to go on to questions and um, I'd like to invite Rima. Rima, you have some questions for us, um, to the panelists. 
Yes, hello, good evening to good everyone. Evening. Good evening, Rima. And the first question is directed to Ephraim Serret. Why is this approach that you studied under not developed in Trinidad and Tobago to ensure the marriage between sports and academics work for our students? To, to answer that question, um, it has to do with our system, our system in Trinidad and Tobago. And as I indicated, uh, sport is not taken seriously in Trinidad and, in Trinidad and Tobago. So that it, 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 it is not on, on high on the priority. Um, you know, it's more, we're more focused on the academic part of it. Um, so I am, I, I am hoping, I was happy when I was invited to be part of this because I see it as a, you know, a starting point. Um, to, to have such a system uh, operating in Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, Howard just indicate, uh, mentioned of J.U. Gordon. J.U., I mean, we should be, the, the tertiary level and, and institutions should be really doing things to sell their programs that attract our athletes and encourage them to stay home. Um, we have athletes in track and field who would have won medals on the world stage training out of home. So Darrell Brown would have won a silver medal at the World Championship training out of training Trinidad and Tobago. Keyshawn Walcott won an Olympic gold medal training out of Trinidad and Tobago. So we, we have seen that. So there, there really isn't, I mean, we have this notion that US foreign is best. So everybody wants to go out to, 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 to the universities outside, but it is very costly. And, it, and they, they, they go because they don't have the confidence in the system in Trinidad and Tobago. And as Howard mentioned, J.U. Gordon opted to stay in Trinidad and Tobago to study. But I am not sure whether the institution he was at understood what it took to have him there because he was a pro athlete, have to leave school, to go to Europe to compete and, and those kind of things. And I am not sure whether any lessons were learned from that so that they could develop to encourage the athletes, be it footballers, track and field, whatever sport, to stay at home. Okay, thank this, you, thank next, you. Quest yeah. Yeah, really. this next question is directed to Donna Marie. Do you think that improving sporting facilities for universities locally encourage more students to participate in sports or even encourage more talented athletes to stay in our system. This is from Tyler Austin. Yes, I really do believe if we have the facilities to have our athletes to compete and feel more comfortable, be, you know, if we're on par with other facilities that we could, you know, be able to train properly we could be able, we would have more athletes wanting to compete. They would want to be more involved. They will feel the, you know, for example, we have facilities such as the swimming complex in Kuva, which is, you know, coming back on par with other Olympic facilities and whatnot. And I think that these things that if we get them used, if we get them available, sorry, to our athletes, so, you know, they will be wanting to be more involved as well too. Um, and yeah, I think, I think basically, yeah. <laughs> Another question for Donna Marie Wickham. Yeah. UTT is a local and national university in Trinidad and Tobago. How important is the success of this university to the, to the government? Sorry. And this is from Lindell Hoyt Sanchez. Having this program be successful is very important. As it was mentioned before, sport is not one of the high priority areas when it comes, in my opinion, when it comes to this country. And I think we don't realize how much should come out of sport, what the how um, students can be educated, how we could even promote sport tourism as mentioned in the last um, webinar. Um, it can bring so much to the country, so much new things, so much new developments. And we have to realize that sport will push this country forward in such a direction that it will really skyrocket us if we actually put in work and have our administrators work together and have us all working together to be able to push forward. 
Thank you, Anna Marie. Rima? Rima, maybe Another we question. Take, Rima, maybe you could take a look two more questions. Yes. Okay, okay, sure. This question is from Calston Gray, New Jersey, and it's directed to Alvin Cornell. He asks, what do you think, what do you believe, sorry, is needed to provide a stream of athletes in all sports from kindergarten to university? Hello? I'm sorry, um, Mr. Cornell, did you hear the question? I heard the question, but no, the, the screen is still dark. I didn't know I was on. I'm sorry. Okay, I can repeat the question if you'd like. Well, um, yes, would you please? Okay. Sure, sir. This is from Carlston Gray mm -hmm. from New Jersey. And he asks, what do you believe is needed to provide a stream of athletes in all sports from kindergarten through university? Well, it has to be a well-organized program. We are not very good at organizing development programs. We have natural talent, and this is probably the reason why we didn't go in that direction, because Hazley Crawford was born in, in San Fernando, and he would train anywhere. Brian Lara would play in this one. He would have done. What we need is a proper development out of our young people. We need to help them to understand. We need to develop them, develop them physically and intellectually at a very young age. The words sound big, but it's very simple for them to go on. We must watch their upgrading from primary school into the secondary school system. They, they learn skill and in the primary stage, they, they learn to be coached in the secondary stage. And at that time, they confront themselves at the age of 17 and 18 and 19 with our top athletes, simply because they are well-groomed into the system. We are lacking that development and organization within the system, not only within the system, but with intelligent coaching programs, which is the most necessary thing in the world. We've had Roger Gibbon, we've had Gene Samuel, we've had uh, so many top-class athletes with what we what was not properly done. If we would only put it together and look at six years down the road, and trust me, it'll be, it will be exactly what we're looking for. Okay, and this is the um, last question, as time has permitted. Um, this is directed to Mr. Ephraim Serrett, and it's from Leroy Fitness. And he asks, do you think it would be wise to infiltrate the Parent Teachers Association, highlighting the benefits of sport participation from a young age and the varied benefits to derive from it? Well, for me, it's, it's, it's a holistic uh, approach uh, with the parents because we have to educate the parents. And as I indicated earlier, most parents don't see the importance of sport. So before, as I said, before a child is born, we want to know which practice and school is preschool and that kind of stuff. We don't see sport at all. Sport is nowhere in the picture. Um, and I don't think we, we understand that. Even at the, the national level, the, the, when, we, when we have a national budget that is red, um, tourism might be to the bottom of the table and then sport where funding is, is, is allocated. And um, in my travels, sport has, is the, is the thing, sport and culture, I should say, are the two things that put the country on the map. So when you travel, people ask about Brian Lara, Dwight York, Casey Crawford, Atto Golden, these people, you know, Marcel Matano, Sparrow, they ask about these people. But the, type, the, the investment is not there. And the education part, where we're supposed to be educating the, the society about the, the importance of sport and what sport can do. I, I said just now, if it was for sport, I, I'm not too sure, sure where I would have been. And uh, that education needs to, to take place from, from the parents, the, whole, the entire society, so that they could understand and to have the, 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 the young ones, as Alvin said, they come through the system, they understand what, they, what we're trying to do, they go into the secondary level, understanding and having that, that, that balance with respect to development in the sport, 
the development with their work. And I mean, I've heard tonight people, you know, some studies indicating that those who participate in sports, uh, you know, tend to do better in, in the, 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 the academics and that kind of thing. So it's an educational aspect to the entire society about the importance of the role that sport play in the development of our country. Thank you, thank you, Ephraim. Thank you, Raymond. So ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this webinar tonight. Uh, we want to thank you panelists for your words of wisdom. Your, uh, you, have, you really give us a lot of food for thought. And we are, we, are, we are recording this webinar and we are also taking notes. We are, not, we are definitely going to take all your information forward, forward to the relevant uh, bodies and authorities with the hope that in Trinidad and Tobago, we will have a system whereby we can actually take our athletes from, from the ground level up to high performance into international level. So again, ladies and gentlemen, want, lady and gentlemen, I want to say thank you so much for being spending your time with us tonight. And before I leave, I just want to tell you to remind you to tune in again next Thursday for our fourth webinar in the series of five, uh, where we do sport law and drugs in sport. And the moderator for that webinar will be Tyrone Marcus, and among the panelists will be Jamie Lamboy, Christopher Raffet, and Dr. Terry Ali. So, Ali, thank you for coming for coming all the way from Brazil to us, right? Um, I want to tell the panelists, please get safely to your various homes, right? And join us again next Tuesday for our fourth webinar. Thank you and good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you so much. That's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Alvin, again. Thank okay. You. You're very welcome, Howard. Thank you. How, how would you be the safe one going home? We home. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I have to get home too. Yes, yes. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> darling. We'll be safe. We'll be have, safe. A, have a good one. Thanks. Have a good one.